The CDC has issued a sweeping health order requiring travelers to wear a mask on all forms of public transportation. The federal order officially goes into effect Monday night. The move makes it easier for transportation officials to enforce penalties for violations. The mandate comes just days after President Biden signed an executive order calling on government agencies to comply with any mask guidelines issued by the CDC. CBS News has also learned FEMA is requesting as many as 10,000 troops to help set up vaccination sites across the country. Defense officials say their goal is to open 50 so-called mega centers capable of administering 6,000 shots a day. The agency wants to open the first site by mid-February. Those sites may get access to another new vaccine. CBS's Michael George reports. In the race to vaccinate a nation, Johnson & Johnson's announcement Friday that it intends to apply for emergency approval from the FDA as early as next week comes as at least seven states have given the first dose of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines to more than 10 percent of their adult populations. Florida is not one of them, and seniors in Fort Myers waited in 17-hour long lines Friday. In St. Louis, after Yvonne Lakes lost her husband to COVID. He was the sweetest man. Her appointment date had already passed. She just said, we're sorry, we don't have any appointments available. Johnson & Johnson's vaccine could help alleviate a complicated process. It's a single shot that can be stored in a regular refrigerator. There's no question that this vaccine is going to be a game changer. In trials, it had 72% efficacy against moderate and severe infection and 85% efficacy in preventing serious symptoms. Neither will stop you from having COVID, or if you have COVID, it has a much milder course. and It'll stop you from needing to worry about ever getting so sick that you have to go to the hospital or die. But it may not be as effective against new strains that continue to appear. There's a lot of virus circulating in the community. There will be the evolution of mutants because that's what viruses do. That means that we will have to be nimble to be able to just adjust readily to make versions of the vaccine. And there's new hope for school children from the Centers for Disease Control. CDC continues to recommend that K through 12 schools be the last setting to close after all other mitigations have measures have been employed and the first to reopen when they can do so safely. There may be vaccines for them too. Hopefully by the time we get to the late spring and early summer, we will have children being able to be vaccinated according to the FDA's guidance. Joining me now for more is Dr. Stanley Perlman. He is a professor of microbiology and immunology at the University of Iowa, go Hawks, and a pediatric infectious disease physician. Dr. Perlman, thank you, of course, for joining us and for all the work that you do. Let's start right off with that new CDC mandate requiring masks on transportation. How much impact do you think that will actually have on the spread of this pandemic? Well, it depends how much mask use was being done before. So I think masks, what we know now is that masks help, and the better the mask, the more they help. So we think that having a mandate on all these public transportation uh, vehicles will be very helpful, particularly ones which have more closed space, which they really all do, and not great ventilation. So I think it should help. And so people have to wear them properly. And again, uh, some masks are a little better than others, but wearing any mask is better than wearing none. It's a good reminder that I, I, I know that everybody has been guilty at times of forgetting to bring that mask back up after pulling it down, uh, that wearing a mask over your ears doesn't accomplish anything. Um, Dr. Perlman, you also sat on the FDA committee that approved both the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. How, how are you feeling about this new Johnson & Johnson vaccine and the fact that it, it is at least slightly less effective than the other two that are already in use, even though there are other attributes that are very positive about it, like the single dose? Yep. So the numbers seem to be a little less. But remember, when we first started thinking about vaccines, we were excited if we were going to get a 60 to 70 percent efficacy rate. And here we are, Moderna and Pfizer have 90 percent or so. This one's over 70 percent, so it still meets our criteria for being an excellent uh, vaccine. The other thing is, uh, so far from what I've seen, the and I haven't seen all the data yet, it looks like this prevents most very severe disease. And that's really uh, the first goal of vaccine, is that you want to protect against severe disease because 
uh, those are the people who end up in the ICU who may die from the infection. So, and, the, and I think the numbers are a little better, as you have on the screen, uh, for severe infection. It may even be better than that, depending on how severe infection is actually defined. Hmm. Um, let's also talk about some of these variants. Uh, how possible is it to adapt these vaccines that, that are already uh, in development now to be stronger against the variants that we're starting to identify? Um, and, and what is actually being done in terms of, of responding to these new variants that we're seeing right now? Yeah, so I think that what we know about these variants, let's go back, just back one step. So the variants seem to transmit a little better from person to person. The one in the UK doesn't seem to do anything else. Does. Maybe it causes slightly more severe disease. I think the jury is still out on that. So the things we worry about is spread. Does it cause more severe disease? Does it evade a vaccine or an immune response? In all cases, we're still learning about it. In terms of the uh, vaccines, we think that some of the new variants, particularly the ones from South Africa and Brazil, may slightly evade the immune response, but not in everybody, only in some people. And so protection of the vaccine against people who are infected with these viruses uh, appears to be a little less. But we still don't know yet uh, how important this is in terms of severe disease. We still think the vaccine will have efficacy, uh, at least partial efficacy, against all these variants. But because of the nature of the way these vaccines are made, it's fairly um, straightforward, though time-consuming, in terms of getting it manufactured, to make vaccines that could uh, respond directly to these new variants. The other thing is, as a virologist, what I keep hoping is that these viruses, as they mutate, will actually become uh, more attenuated, less able to cause severe disease, because that's what viruses usually do. But so far, we have not seen that. So I, I'm, that leads to a follow-up question. For people who had previously had COVID, the, the original strain that was here in the United States, is it possible for them to get reinfected with a new variant? It sounds like that is still a possibility. Um, but from what I'm hearing from you, and tell me if I'm right, uh, the hope is that, that the disease would at least um, be uh, slightly less, uh, less uh, dangerous than if, if somebody's already gone through COVID previously. Yeah, that's the idea. So the disease will be less dangerous. And the, the other thing we don't know that's equally important is, will this infect, will this affect the ability of the person who's reinfected to transmit the virus to a susceptible person who's near them? So those are the two parts about vaccination. We want to prevent severe disease. We want to prevent spread. And we really don't know much about the second part with any of these vaccines, the prevention of spread. And so we know even less about if it will prevent, uh, deal with uh, prevention of spread of these new variants. And while we're on the subject of these new variants, I'm wondering, uh, as you're making projections and you're seeing all the research um, and, and the idea of achieving herd immunity, which is what we've all been working towards, um, do these new variants slow down our ability to achieve herd immunity by the end of 2021? Well. I think we don't know because we don't know how much of a uh, problem this will be. In theory, if you have another virus that can partly overcome the infection, uh, then you may slow down herd immunity because those people who are vaccinated may still be able to transmit the virus. That's one of the way the vaccines work is preventing transmission. That's how herd immunity works. So if there's still virus able to grow in the uh, upper airways and the uh, nasal cavity, and in theory, you may get more transmission than with the original strain. So it may take a little longer to reach herd immunity. Just points out the two important features. Vaccinations is important. As many people as uh, can get it, should get it. And the second part is we still have to do things like wear masks when, uh, when in uh, areas where, where as mandated and that we need to uh, practice uh, social distancing and all the other things that we've talked about for the last few months. Can I just clarify that point, though? Are you saying that people, even after they've been vaccinated, given these new strains, should continue to wear masks and practice social distancing? I think because I think we still have to be cautious because we don't know how much the vaccines uh, prevent transmission. We think there's going to be an effect, maybe a major effect. But until that's known, uh, we, we don't know uh, what, what, how it's going to work. The vaccines will help. But we, we I think with this pandemic, if we've learned anything, is that we have to be cautious because uh, it keeps surprising us, keeps doing things that we uh, predict wouldn't happen. And so I predict nothing anymore. So I, I tend to be very cautious with this. <laughs> 
All right. Dr. Stanley Perlman, thank you. You're welcome.